Mr. Morris, could you please state your full name to the jury and spell your last name? Uh, Thomas Morris, Jr., M-O-R-R-I-S. Uh, and Mr. Morris, <coughs> could you tell the jury how you're employed? Uh, I work part-time for the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department as a consulting reconstructionist for the Traffic Safety Division. I also uh, have a private practice accident reconstruction uh, consulting business. I provide services to the legal community, both in civil and criminal matters. And Mr. Morris, how long have you been uh, doing accident reconstruction? Uh, since uh, 2000. Uh, getting accreditation from ACTAR, what does that uh, entail? It entails you, you submit a, uh, a curriculum vitae with a level of experience uh, to be uh, qualified to sit for the exam. And then uh, after you sit for an exam, it's a eight hour exam, a four hour practical and a four hour theoretical uh, that involves actually reconstructing an accident and the uh, uh, practical portion of the examination. Could you tell the jury specifically about your <laughs> education and training in, in your field? Uh, I attended the Northwestern University Center for Public Safety uh, back in 1998, uh, their three week accident reconstruction course. Um, I also attended the, um, uh, an accident investigation course that I uh, received a certificate from them on. Uh, then I uh, applied and sat for the ACTAR accreditation exam in 2002. Uh, and I've been involved uh, in working with the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department since the year 2000. In the year 2000, uh, I provided the initial training when they purchased total station surveying equipment to document and process accident uh, scenes. Uh, and then I worked under contract with them from 2003 through 2017, providing consulting services on uh, cases. And then in 2017, I was hired as a public safety specialist working as a consulting reconstructionist. Okay. Uh, and just to be clear for the jury, Mr. Morris, are you a police officer? I am not. Have you ever been a police officer? I have not. Um, Your Honor, at this time, the state tenders Mr. Morris as an expert in the field of accident reconstruction. Any objection? No. All right, he'll be tendered as an expert. Uh, Mr. Morris, um, were you called to consult with the uh, Officer Moran on a crash that occurred on February 18th of last year? I was. Okay. And what, what is your understanding? I guess, why, were you told why you were being called in to consult on that case? It was the following day of the accident, and... Um, Essentially, it was to uh, document and collect uh, evidence from the vehicles themselves. Um, so we went to the tow yard for a uh, post uh, inspection and to conduct uh, additional investigations. Uh, accident reconstructions are uh, a level that involve evidence that includes human factors, which would involve the drivers, evidence from the roadway, and evidence from the vehicles themselves. Uh, I was not called to the scene that evening, but um, after it had occurred, I was requested to come in to help process the uh, remainder of the evidence by examination of the vehicles and looking at the data that would be recovered from the vehicles. Okay. Um, and how did you begin your work on this case? Uh, in this particular case, the first thing that we did was to uh, recover the uh, airbag control module data, uh, which is typically the uh, one thing that we would try and do on every particular case that the data is available. Um, it's uh, over time, in my experience, it's been very reliable and a reliable source of information to allow us to understand how a collision occurred and the events leading up to the collision. Okay. And Mr. Morris, did you, um, were you present uh, at a meeting at the Circuit Attorney's Office in February um, of this year when data was re-downloaded from the two airbag control modules seized in this case? I was. Okay. Um, was any error indicated when that download was performed? It was not. Based on your training and experience, uh, was there any indication whatsoever that the data was compromised or corrupted? No. Have you reviewed the report? Um, so after that data was, after the airbag control modules were re-imaged, um, and that was placed into, that was put into the Bosch uh, tool, did you review the reports generated by that tool? I did. Okay. And um, in your was there any indication that the reports um, for either airbag control module were unreliable or had, uh, had were indicating an error? No. Okay. While this is fresh in the jury's mind, I want to call your attention to what was previously admitted as State's Exhibit 29. This would be the report relating to 
the airbag control module for the Audi. Take you to the first page. Are you able to see that on the screen? Uh, yes. Morris? This, this indicates that the uh, data was imaged on February 13th of this year. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. There were questions about the sequence of events. Um, in this case, the airbag control module for the Audi reported more than one event. Is that right? That's correct. Uh, is that a problem? No. Why not? The system is designed to record multiple events, uh, and also the airbag control module is designed to select the deployment of the correct airbags to best protect the occupants as a result of a collision. So when airbags first started being put in vehicles, they were essentially just frontal airbags, steering wheel and passenger side above the glove box. Uh, as the technology advanced over time, what you found is, is that the uh, manufacturers started to provide additional protection for rollover instances, side impacts with side curtain airbags, bolsters in the seats. So depending on where the acceleration forces are applied to the vehicle, the system is going to decide which airbags are best to be deployed to protect the occupants. Okay. How did you determine in this case, with respect to those events, how many events were reported? Uh, three. Okay. And did you determine which event temporarily occurred first uh, in real time? Yes. And how were you able to determine that? When you look at the, the uh, data summary page for that particular event, it shows time elapsed since the first prior event. So the one that shows zero so millisecond. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ms. Marks. I'm going to just, so that it's clear to the jury, I'm just going to move to the first thing. Uh, okay. So this, do you agree this is the data relating to what the system uh, identifies as event three, or I mean, it says record one and it says most recent. Correct. Okay. And then for that, it says event counter at event. Do you see that? Yes. What does that mean? And it, it says number three here. It's the third event that's been recorded. Okay. And then it says, uh, Is there anything in the report that indicates how long the time has elapsed since? Yeah, I believe it's the, if I can see well enough, it's the fourth line where it says time from initial event to current event. So the initial event would be the first event that it recorded, and that's reading 1,574 milliseconds. A millisecond is just one one thousandth of a second, so we're looking at 1.5 seconds or so. Okay. So do I understand that means this event was recorded approximately one and a half seconds after what would be record three. That's correct. Okay. So I'm going to move to record three. On this page at the top row, it says for event counter at event, what is the number reported there? Number one. Okay. And on that, that fourth um, row that you referred us to, time from initial event, uh, what is the uh, number reported there? Uh, zero. Okay. So this would be the first event recorded. Uh, now, there was testimony from another witness who was asked about um, side airbag deployment. Um, does the airbag control module record when a air airbag uh, deployment is commanded by the system? Yes, and that's why it records it as a deployment event. And there's also a table that shows the time that it took to deploy the airbag system. Okay. And based on your understanding of the sequence of the crash, what was the first impact involved in the sequence of events uh, in this incident? It was a collision from the, uh, with the Malibu, striking the left side of the Audi. Okay. So, um, 
terms of a front, rear, side, how would you characterize that impact? It would be side, and based on the data limitations page, it would generate a uh, positive force based upon the sign, so it's a, a positive delta V, left to right. And based on your training and experience, what, if any, airbag would you expect to be commanded to be deployed in that event? Uh, typically, it would be on the side uh, where the uh, occupant was, which would be the driver, and the side where the uh, uh, force is being acted upon, so the driver's side. Okay. So, moving now, uh, this table that is titled Deployment Command Data Record Free, what, is, what information is in, uh, contained in this table? Essentially, it's indicating which airbags were deployed and how long it took for those airbags to deploy. Okay. And we see in the, comma, in the row for side airbag, time to first stage deployment, driver, milliseconds, there's a number 10. What does that mean? 10 milliseconds it took to deploy that airbag. So uh, 10 one thousandths of a second, or one one hundredth of a second. So does this record indicate that an airbag was commanded to be deployed? It does. Which airbag? Uh, the, uh, the side curtain or side airbag uh, driver. Is that, is anything about that surprising based on your understanding of the sequence of events? Not at all. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that um, because that issue was just raised. I'm gonna come back to um, your analysis in this case. So after the Anytime you recover airbag control module data, part of the first paragraph of almost every report that you uh, uh, produce using the tool will indicate that the data should not be relied upon in and of itself in a vacuum. In other words, whatever data is recovered needs to be compared to the other data that's recovered at the scene, the evidence in its totality, which would include roadway evidence, it would include the damage to the vehicles, it would include witness testimony, it would also include uh, any video evidence from surveillance. Okay, and what, if any, other evidence did, I guess, um, <coughs> did you perform an analysis to determine whether the airbag control module data was reliable? Yes, uh, and what I wanted to do is be able to use the um, um, airbag control module data from both vehicles to check the, the reported speeds that it was providing. So in this particular case, I used a traditional conservation of linear momentum technique. Um, in order to determine the impact speed of the Audi. So we were calculating that using the data that we recovered from the uh, um, Chevy uh, Malibu. Uh, okay. So we used that impact speed. And in other words, if we can use the impact speed of two independent recording devices and it provided a range that was consistent with the reported speed from the Audi, we would have a higher degree of confidence in the data that it was providing. I also conducted a Hold on one All right. Okay. At the risk of boring everyone to death with math, what data do you rely on when you do a calculation that you refer to as a conservation of linear momentum? Uh, momentum is a uh, conservation of momentum, and momentum is a quantity of motion, which is defined as the product of a mass of an object times its velocity. Um, it has both magnitude and it has direction. So we have to take into account the approach angles, the departure angles, the weights of both vehicles, and the speed of two of those particular elements to be able to solve for one unknown. So in other words, you, the equation you're walking into, you have pre-collision momentum uh, from two units, and you have post-collision momentum from two, unit, two individual units. Um, I have essentially three unknowns. I can only solve for when I have uh, two unknowns, so I have to zero out one of the elements, which I can do by adjusting the angle using trigonometry. And I know I'm not supposed to bore you, but... And then what, I'm uh, going to be there, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Does that calculation rely on data from either airbag control module? Uh, the momentum calculation does. Okay. And, it, and essentially what I'm using is the reported pre-impact speed of the Malibu to calculate what the, the uh, speed would be for the other vehicle. 
Since those two modules do not communicate with each other, uh, if I use this, the reported speed of the uh, Malibu and it gives me a range of values that is consistent with the reported speed of the Audi, I have confidence that the reported speed of the Audi is accurate and correct. So if I'm understanding you right, you don't rely on data from the Audi's airbag control module. You look at just the data from the uh, uh, the Malibu's airbag control module, and then you put in the weights and do your calculation, and then see if that range of speeds calculated is consistent with the uh, data from the app. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. Um, in addition to that calculation, did you perform any other kinds of calculations to determine a range of speed? We also looked at a conservation of energy analysis, which does not require direction. So what we're looking at is both objects that are moving as, as a result of their motion can, are, possess what's called kinetic energy. Um, as a result of a collision, that, that kinetic energy in a closed system is conserved. So it never gets larger, it never gets smaller, it just gets transformed into different types of energy. In this particular case in a collision, you have some go into the permanent deformation of the vehicles, some go into heat, some go into noise, and then there's post-collision movement of both vehicles to rest. Using that method, were you able to calculate a range of speeds for the Audi? Yes, I was. Did you use any other methods to calculate a range of speeds for the Audi? Uh, I'm trying to think back to my report. If you need to. Yes, if I, if I could look at it, just so I make sure that I'm complete. And I want you to read your report. No. Okay, so we have essentially uh, three different methods that we use to validate the uh, data from the ACM. So the ACM data appears there. We use conservation of linear momentum using the reported speed of the Malibu to calculate the range of impact speeds for the Audi. And then we also, also use Virtual Crash 4, which is a simulation software. I input the values of the, the, uh, that were reported by the ACM to compare the post-collision movement and direction of the vehicles, and I got reasonable uh, reasonably consistent movement uh, with the uh, physical evidence or what that was identified by the physical evidence at the scene. Okay. Um, I want to, with respect to each of those methods that you described, for each of those methods uh, in your field generally regarded as reliable. Yes. It's a reliable method to calculate vehicle speed. Yes. Okay. Um, so with respect to that, I want you to tell the jury for each calculation, what was the range of speeds calculated for the Audi? Um, using virtual crash, our range of values were uh, 44.9 to 45.1. Uh, the airbag control module, when you take into account the uh, uh, known precision rate of plus or minus 4%, that range was 43.2 to 46.8. Uh, evaluating uh, conservation of energy and crush, uh, the range was 42.7 to 49.2, and conservation of linear momentum was 41.2 to 66.9 miles per hour. And just, what was the lowest speed that you calculated using any of those methods on the low end of the range? Uh, conservation of linear momentum at 41.2 miles per hour. And what was the highest speed that you calculated using any of those methods? Uh, conservation of linear, linear momentum at 66.9. Okay. And the data from the airbag control module, it fell within the range of all three of those ranges. Is that right? That's correct. And that was, what was the speed indicated at impact for the Audi? Uh, from the airbag control module was 45, I believe. Okay. Did you use, uh, so there was a conversation I guess there was testimony earlier about using video to estimate speed. In your field, are you familiar with uh, methods available to use video to estimate speed? Yes. Okay. Um, did you do that in this case? In this particular case, no. Uh, the best video that we had available to us, um, the uh, events happened in the periphery of the video. Um, so if um, if you've ever looked at surveillance footage or cameras, you understand that in order to capture a wider field of range, the, it has sort of a fisheye effect where there's distortion around the edges. 
So in the area that we would need to measure, we would need uh, essentially very specific measurements to make the correction to the camera parameters in order to correct for that distortion. Based on your uh, training and experience, <coughs> was there video available in this case that could be used to reliably estimate the speed of the either vehicle? Uh, in this particular instance, uh, with what we had available at the time, I would say no. Um, the, the information, what you have to understand is the further you get away from the camera, the pixel size represents a larger value or dimension. So that if in front I have, say, maybe a thousand pixels per foot, each one of those pixels represents one one thousandth of a foot. The further I get away from the camera, that pixel might represent a whole foot itself. So if I'm off by a pixel, then my error rate increases the further I get away from the camera. And in the, uh, the camera view that we were examining that had the both vehicles, uh, or had the vehicle approach from the, the Malibu going northbound uh, and show the collision site and the post-collision movement of the Audi, uh, it was too far away to reliably place uh, the uh, uh, analogs of the vehicles in the correct locations to calculate speed. Okay. Um. And I think there may have been there were questions, though, about the reference to video in the reconstruction report. You did refer to video evidence in your report, is that right? That's correct. And you did use the video in other ways to corroborate uh, the airbag control module. Data. Yes. Fair? Okay, and how did you use the video then? Uh, using the pre-crash data, it reports both time and velocity. So if if you remember back to the word problems back in your algebra class, if you drive 60 miles an hour for one hour, you travel 60 miles. So essentially what we can do is we can take the data that is being reported in the pre-crash data from event one. It records a speed and it records an elapsed time. We model that as a curve on a graph, and then the area under the graph tells us how far that vehicle has traveled in that five seconds. Uh, Mr. Morris, for the jury's benefit, could you tell them what uh, State's Exhibit 34 is? Essentially, in order to visualize the data that was being reported by the airbag control module of both vehicles, I created a simulation using Virtual Crash 5. Um, that simulation is based upon the data that was recovered from the airbag control module. So what you'll see in the... Uh, and I'm sorry, I'll publish that, Your Honor, if I may. Okay. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the graph there. The lines represent the, um, the lines represent the data that uh, is being exported from Virtual Crash. So once I created the simulation, I exported the speed versus time data, and then the dots that appear on those particular graphs are the overlay of the data that was recovered from the airbag control module. In this way, you can be confident that. What you're observing in the visualization created in Virtual Crash 5 is essentially the, what is the, the data is representing inside from the airbag control module reports. Okay. We saw when we looked at the, um, the report generated from the airbag control module, there was a uh, break input one and a half seconds before impact. Is, is that fair, approximately? I believe so. Okay. Is that represented by that dip here? That's correct. Acceleration, okay. And then this is consistent, just to make this simple, that's consistent with the final reported speed at impact for the Audi, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And the other curve, this uh, line that represents velocity for the Malibu, is that right? That's correct. Plotted over the same period of time. Uh, yeah, they both record five seconds of pre-crash data. Assume I'm a four-year-old. Explain how what this diagram, how you use that to validate the velocity from that. So essentially what I wanted to do is make sure that the simulation or the visualization accurately represented 
and fairly represented the data that was recovered from the air bank control modules. So essentially, the purpose of the visualization or simulation is just to provide you and to show you what that data looks like, as opposed to just examining numbers themselves. What we're seeing here is, as I've placed a target, and in those half-second increments where the data is actually being reported by the airbag control module. So I placed the uh, vehicles in the same locations in those half-second increments, consistent with uh, the data that was reported from the, the ACMs, um, so that you can visualize where that vehicle was in each of the elements that was reported in the five seconds leading up to the impact. Okay. So, uh, and then you referred to video before. Did you compare this analysis against the video? I guess, let me back up. So I'm just going to walk through to the first vehicle. That each box represents a position that would have been, the, would have been the vehicle's position at that time interval. Is that right? Correct. In every half second interval. Okay. So in the first, we're covering two and a half seconds with these uh, five boxes, is that right? That's correct, because okay. it's accelerating from, I believe, five miles per hour is the first element recorded. Okay. And then I referenced a break input at one and a half seconds prior to impact. Would that be consistent with <coughs> the interval here where the speed decreases from 38.69 miles per hour to 38? Point zero seven seven miles per hour. That's correct. Okay, and then when they're back control module, we know there's a hundred percent accelerator input. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so that, is that consistent with the velocity then increasing in the next half second to forty one point sixty nine miles per hour? Yes. Okay, and then at impact, you have forty four point seven six eight miles per hour. Right. The reported speed was actually 45, plus or minus 4%. It falls within the range of accepted values for the airbag control module precision. And then, with respect to the Malibu, each box, again, that represents half a second interval. Is that right? That's correct. And velocity for the Malibu is consistent for the first almost four seconds, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And then the velocity decreases until finally it's 26 miles per hour at point of Right, so the last data we have is half a second. That's correct. So we extrapolated that data to continue to deceleration at the same rate to calculate the impact speed at 26. Okay. As you can see from the data, every half second it seems to be decreasing one mile per hour from 28 to 27. So in an additional half second, you would expect it to drop another one mile per hour if that uh, deceleration rate was consistent to 26. Essentially, since we know the area of the impact of the vehicle and the distance traveled, uh, we can also, uh, uh, as, since we were able to calculate the entire distance traveled over the five seconds leading up to the collision, we can calculate the distance traveled between any of the segments over that five second range. So in other words, from the impact location to where the brake was applied and where the throttle was applied, we can calculate that distance. And what this element shows is where the... Uh, so before you walk us through that, sure. uh, Mr. Marks, um, is that diagram, you created that diagram? That's correct. Did you use the same methods you described earlier today um, in order to prepare that? I did. Um, you're on the right to move to admit what's been marked for identification as state exhibit 36. 
orient us on this, uh, this image, what direction is in the, the top right, cardinal direction in the top right of this diagram? That's nominally north, so that is 11th Street. Okay. This is 11th Street, is that right? Yes. And this would be St. Charles Street here? That's correct. Okay. Going westbound. And um, now, I'm sorry, I interrupted you before. Can you walk us through what is indicated on this diagram, what these uh, represent? So using the pre-crash data, the reported speeds versus time, I was able to calculate uh, the distance from the impact location, which is time of zero, um, where that vehicle was when the events occurred leading up to the impact. The two events that we were interested in is when the brake was applied and when the 100% throttle was reapplied after the and in this particular instance, the brake was applied approximately 89 feet from where the vehicle was located at impact. Uh, the 100% throttle was 60, uh, approximately 61 feet. Mr. Morris, I'm showing you what's been marked by identification. Space Exhibit 38, another diagram that you prepared? Yes. Okay. Did you, you create that diagram using the same methods, um, using the same data that you've described previously? I did. Or State would move to admit um, State Exhibit 38. diagram, we calculate a position where 100% throttle was commanded for the Audi, is that right? That's correct. Okay. And then, okay. in this diagram, uh, what do we see? What does that yellow line represent? I see it as a green line, so I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but if you're referring to the line going across, essentially we took the, uh, the cloud data that was recovered uh, at the scene from using the Leica P40 scan station, uh, created a 3D model, and it placed the uh, position of the building that's on the southeast corner of the intersection, which would have served as a side obstruction to both vehicles approaching the area where the collision occurred. Um, since we know the time and distance, and we know the relative positions of the vehicle based on the fact that they arrived at the collision point at the same time, we were able to work backwards to determine at what point in time uh, a vehicle uh, approaching westbound on St. Charles would first become visible to a driver that was proceeding northbound on 11th Street. Okay. And then uh, this uh, green line is projected from the windshield of the Malibu, is that right? That's correct. But we would use the same angle if we wanted to project the view from the um, Audi, we just have to offset it, is that right? That's correct. It would be a little, the angle would be a little bit different. Um, what I wanted to illustrate here and examine is the response of the uh, driver that was operating the Malibu that was proceeding northbound. Okay. So what I did was I took the angle to the very front of the car, which would be the first portion visible. Okay. And specifically, why was that, um, why did you want to consider that issue? Uh, essentially to evaluate the response of a driver that's approaching northbound to see whether or not the response was reasonable based upon a normal response time uh, compiled from research. Okay. And based on uh, your calculation, did you form an opinion as to whether um, the driver of the Malibu could have reacted in time Based upon the, the research, uh, eccentricity uh, lengthens response time. 
So in other words, the further away an object is from, your, from straight ahead, the longer it takes to respond to it. In this particular case, you can see that the angle is not directly ahead of the driver of the Malibu. They would, out, they would have to look in that direction, so it actually increased the, the response. Uh, in comparing it to uh, published research and making adjustments for the conditions of this particular case, our the mean response time will be no response at all. So essentially, this event where the first line of sight would have occurred approximately 1.1 second prior to the collision, there wouldn't have been enough time for a uh, driver to have responded to this particular uh, circumstance. Okay. And I want to, just comparing this to the data that we, we have about when 100% when throttle is commanded, do you have, so using the same 3D model that you created, did you form an opinion as to whether the Audi would have had view of that roadway at the point that 100% throttle is commanded? I didn't specifically, but in the area that we're looking at, the, certainly the line of sight would have existed for the Malibu at that point. Uh, it would have been a short time after that that, that the vehicle would have been visible to the uh, operator of the uh, Audi. Okay. And then I think we'll, we'll come back to that later with the recreations. Um, Mr. Mark, I'm showing you what the mark for identification in this case is at 37. Okay. Um, this case is going to be 37, a chart that you created. Yes, I, it was created using a simulation that I built within Virtual Crash 5. Okay. And that chart plots the actual acceleration rate of the Audi plot, plotted from airbag control module data. Is that correct? Yeah, the slope of the line is the acceleration. So it's actually a plot of, of velocity versus time. Okay. Velocity being the? The, the y-axis vertical. Y vertical. Ah, okay. And then uh, what is the other line that's plotted on there? What does that represent? The, the other element, what I wanted to do is for comparison purposes, since the airbag control module data indicated that the vehicle was being operated for large portions of its uh, uh, five seconds of pre-crash at 100% throttle, what I wanted to do is compare it to a vehicle uh, that would be accelerating at a more typical rate. Uh, so I modeled that using naturalistic driving study that was published um, under research that was conducted by uh, one of the researchers was Jeff Mutard. So a naturalistic driving study is basically going out and observing an intersection where a stop sign exists, and then calculating the position of the vehicle versus time to calculate what a normal acceleration would be over different segments and evaluations. So what I did is I took the data from that particular study to model what a more typical acceleration would be. Okay. Fair at this time, the state would move to admit uh, was marked by identification as State Exhibit 37. Any objection? All right, 37 will be admitted. You may accomplish. Okay. Mr. Marks, to represent, you think you're better <coughs> sense of color. Can you describe the colors, the different lines plotted? Okay, the red line represents the uh, data that was recovered from the airbag control module of the Audi. The blue line represents the modeled acceleration that's consistent with the naturalistic uh, driving study. As you can see, when we discussed earlier, that the area underneath that curve represents the total distance traveled. Um, the area underneath the red curve is obviously larger than the area underneath the blue curve. So if you're accelerating at a more modest rate, then you're not going to cover the same amount of distance at the same time. Okay. And then you actually... Mark, so based on the calculations that you described earlier um, and the original reason that you were consulted in this case, did you um, have sufficient facts and data to determine whether the airbag control module data recovered from the Audi was reliable? In my opinion, it was reliable essentially because it matched the remainder and the totality of the evidence that was collected. So in other words, everything that the alternate means that we used to, to calculate the uh, impact speed of the Audi 
Um, the witness testimony, the video evidence, all was consistent with the evidence that was re uh, recovered and analyzed uh, using these techniques. Okay. Um, and then, did you perform a further step where you actually created a simulation of the crash? I did using the data that was recovered from the airbag control module. I found in my experience that it's best understood instead of just examining numbers themselves to be able to visualize and look at that data uh, as you would be able to see it had you been there at the time. Okay. And for the velocity uh, data used in your simulation, which data did you use? The airbag control module data. Okay. So you plotted a simulation using the data recovered from both airbag control modules. Is Correct. That and then you got a result showing vehicles uh, after impact, their location, and so on. Is that right? That's correct. And did you compare that against the physical evidence at the scene? Yes. Okay. And did you form an opinion as to whether the simulation was consistent with what was actually observed at the scene? It was. Okay. And so, I'm sorry, your opinion is that I, I think I was asking first if you formed an opinion. I just yes. want the record to be clear. And then what was your opinion? Uh, that, the, uh, that the visualization uh, accurately and fairly represents the physical evidence that was recovered in this case, along with the airbag control module data. These are on a flash drive in our presentation that produced the events. It marked the stage exit 159. That includes. Uh, files A through J. Any objections? No. First thing I'm going to show, uh, Mr. Morris, I think because this is other data that you used, there are two animations called contact clouds. Can you describe uh, how you created those animations and what they represent? <laughs> yes, we used a um, software that's called Dot uh, 3D that's developed by Dot Product in Massachusetts. It uses uh, the LiDAR sensor on iPad or iPhone and allows you to scan in full color and uh, accurately dimension a model of a vehicle. So we went and we actually scanned, uh, scanned the vehicles that were involved in the collision. Um, and then we imported those uh, uh, clouds of data, which would include, um, I think we only imported, used 25 million of the 100 million points that we had captured because it was essentially overkill. Um, to be create two clouds that we could then merge together in uh, Cloud Compare for comparison to see how the vehicles fit together at contact. Um, and based on the 3D scan to both cars, I, th I think you said this, but I'm just making it clear, you then attempt to put the, the damage match up between the two vehicles to find a contact point, is that right? That's correct. You're essentially putting together two puzzle pieces. There, was, uh, there were questions earlier about whether the Audi would have been damaged when it was flipped back over. Uh, through your analysis, did you find any indication that uh, there was damage to Audi that was inconsistent with, I mean, that indicated there would have been further damage after the flip? Uh, no. Okay. I'm going to publish first. This will be 169A. <coughs> So, Mr. Morris, we see at the back um, I just want to be clear for the jury because there uh, the damage to the the right rear area of the 
uh, Audi. Is that fair? That's correct. Okay. Through your analysis, could you did you come up with a hypothesis as to the source of that? At, as a result of the initial collision, um, the vehicle rotated counterclockwise with the back end rotating outwards to strike the parked Corolla with that portion of the vehicle. So this animation represents where the contact point would have been at the first collision, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I'm gonna publish 169E. All right, what do we see in this animation? is a uh, alignment between the uh, damages for the uh, right rear corner of the Audi and the left rear corner of the parked Corolla. I'm sorry, I think it went back to the first. Okay. And do you have an understanding uh, during the collision, it was that the, uh, the victim was struck by the Audi? It would have been the one that was depicted by this animation. Did you review photographs from the scene uh, that depicted uh, tissue and uh, blood at the scene on the Toyota Corolla? I examined the photos that were taken at the scene. Uh, there was also, um, that evidence was still present at the tow yard when we went to do our supplemental uh, scans and were those pictures consistent with the victim being in the position, or at least part of the victim being in the position of that point of contact? Uh, they were. What are we going to see in this animation, Mr. Mark? Essentially, it's a um, uh, simulation or visualization of the pre-crash data that was obtained by imaging modules from both cars. Um, and this is just a view looking uh, eastbound from across the street at the intersection at uh, the northwest corner of uh, St. Charles and London. Okay. And just to, we understand, just to orient ourselves, is this, would this be the Toyota um, where um, that second impact that we saw occur? That's correct. Okay. And you created two other perspectives of the same uh, simulation, is that right? At least two other perspectives. That's correct. Okay. Um, and just to clarify, so all this position data, is that from the Leica scan, the laser scan of the scene as it appeared at the time that Leica scan was done? It is. Okay. I, I will say one caveat there. Um, the uh, police vehicles and first responders that were at the scene were removed since they weren't there at the time that the uh, action, uh, the accident was. So incidentally, as a result of the data collection, it captured more information that wasn't relevant to the collision. So in order to eliminate that noise uh, and restore it to the uh, condition it was at the time of the collision, we removed that data. Okay, thank you for making that clarification. I'm gonna play the, the next view. This is, I'm understanding, this view we're looking east down St. Charles Street, is that right? That's correct. Okay, are you familiar with the location where the Edmondson's Silver Road would have been parked? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. I'm gonna play that. Okay. So just so that the jury understands, you didn't input an animation or a desired result for the simulation to determine where the Audi ends at the simulation, right? In Virtual Crash 4, I simulated and got consistent results, which appears in, in the uh, page here. 
In this particular instance, it follows a path post-collision that is consistent with the video that was reported and also consistent with the initial simulation that I did using Virtual Crash 4. So, in the initial part of the investigation, all we had available to us to do the analysis was Virtual Crash 4. Uh, since then, I, as a result of my private practice, I purchased and upgraded to Virtual Crash 5 to allow us the additional functionality. So essentially, post-collision, it's following the path that's dictated by the physical evidence, the uh, tire marks that were left, the scrapes and gouges, and the um, uh, pitch and roll moments that are identified in observing the video. But it's also been validated with the airbag control module data using 26 and 45 at impact speeds using Virtual Crash 4 that appears on my report on page. And so, Ms. Moore, I'll just stop. I think okay. you answered my question. I appreciate your clarification now. I'm going to move publish uh, E, which is Marcus Collision, E3. So in this view of the collision, we're facing uh, southwest, is that right? That's correct. Now there's, uh, there are two other animations here. They're labeled Audi view and then Audi view with gauges. Can you explain um, what those show? Essentially, it's the same collision. So um, within Virtual Crash, it gives you the ability to place a camera in different locations. So I can place it on the corner, or I can attach it to a moving object, in this case, a vehicle, so you get a better sense of what each driver could have been able to observe upon their approach to the collision point. Okay. So from this animation, I understand we're going to see the view from inside the out. Right. Correct. And then the one that's labeled with gauges, what I did is the airbag control module data, and as well as the vehicle speed as a function of time in the correct location and time in the visual. In the course of um, preparing your analyses in this case, did you review data um, regarding the performance capabilities of a 2023 Audi Q5? Yes. Okay. And why did you do that? I wanted to compare the vehicle as it was being driven based upon our, and compare it to the maximum performance of a vehicle driven at its limits. Okay. And um, can you describe for the jury 
um, based on your analysis, how closely that vehicle was being driven to its maximum performance capability. If you examine the pre-crash data and look at the throttle position, uh, there's only a few of the elements uh, present in those, uh, the, I think, 10 or 11 elements that are presented where the vehicle throttle is not being commanded at 100%. So there's the momentary liftoff where it drops from 100 to zero. Um, initially, I think at the beginning, and I mean, I don't have perfect recollection of the table itself, but, uh, and at the very end, it, it drops off, I think, to like 52, right before impact. So in the areas leading up to it, you have 100% throttle for a majority of the elements that's being recorded in the five seconds pre-crash drops off and it goes back to 100 immediately after he lifts off at that one and a half seconds. I'll publish now 169H. And uh, this would be the view in the simulation from the now view, is that right? That's correct. Finally, there's, a, there's another animation here, uh, and it's titled Audi Normal Acceleration. Can you describe what that animation shows? Essentially, it's the same animation or simulation that we've been looking at, but I superimposed uh, a vehicle, or both a vehicle from the Malibu, uh, traveling at its uh, stated speeds that were in the airbag control module data, and then uh, replacing the Audi with a vehicle that accelerated uh, consistent with the um, uh, naturalistic driving study of a vehicle accelerating from a stop sign. So if it had not accelerated at the limits of the vehicle with 100% throttle, where would that vehicle have been by the time the Malibu reached the collision point? actually see two Audis in this view, is that right? That's correct. They'll separate based upon the relative speeds of the two. Um, you'll also see um, uh, the collision as we've seen it before, and you'll see the results or what the results would have been had the acceleration not been at or near the limit of the vehicle. Okay. <laughs> So at this point, um, <coughs> this stop, so I'm sorry, for the record, I'm publishing, I think it's uh, 169i, and we see uh, there's two Audis represented here where I'm moving the cursor, is that right? That's correct. This one uh, in the background is following that normal acceleration curve you? That's correct. Okay. And you'll see there, there's also blue Malibu. That one, did, I did not model with any deceleration. I just had to continue on at a constant velocity of 29 miles per hour. Okay. And so at this point, in the initial simulation projected over, the collision has already occurred. Is that right? That's correct. Whereas in the, uh, using the other vehicles, we can see collision is not going to happen. Uh, with the second. Option. That's correct. Even even without slowing for the posted yield sign, the vehicle just proceeding through at a normal acceleration rate would have arrived at the collision point after the Malibu had already traversed the intersection. Okay. So my understanding is saying even if the Audi didn't touch its brakes at all, as long as it wasn't pedaled to the metal, the, ac the crash would never happen. That's correct.
With respect to the, all the, so there were three events recorded on the Audi um, airbag control module data, is that right? That's correct. And um, there's, uh, uh, there's, I guess, velocity plotted in how many different axes uh, recorded by the ACM? Uh, the ACM is recording in, it's planar, so it's XY. So it's going to be forwards and backwards, which is called longitudinal, and side to side, which is called lateral. Okay. Um, using, did you look at the data for the other events? I did. Okay. And was there anything about that data that led you to, um, I guess, did you form an opinion as to whether those events um, related to other uh other collisions that the Audi was involved in? Yes. Okay, and specifically, do you have an opinion as to which collisions those events correlate to? Yes, uh, event number, record number three, event number one, which is the first one that occurred, has a uh, lateral uh, impact. It's, a, it's listed as a lateral impact with a positive delta B. The uh, data limitations page on the front of the report indicates the uh, sign notation so that a positive delta B is recorded from left to right. The impact and the first impact from the Malibu was from the left of the Audi to the right. It then rotated and started to roll. And as it rolled, it went sideways, so we had a lateral impact acting from right to left. That should be negative. It also recorded a negative lateral delta B for event number two, record number two. And then when you look at the uh, last event, it shows as a frontal impact, but it also shows the rollover angle sensor. So when you examine the rollover angle sensor, you'll see that the vehicle is inverted, so the rollover sensor is 180 degrees, and we have evidence that the vehicle wound up upside down, sitting on its roof on the roadway. So all of that is consistent. It also shows elapsed time. So the elapsed time between the first event, which is record three, and the second event, record two, is 324 milliseconds. That's uh, 0.324 seconds, the pre-crash data is recorded in half-second intervals, okay? So until it reaches another half-second, we're not going to see additional records. So the pre-crash data for event two and event three should be identical because not enough time has elapsed for it to record an additional record. When you take a look at event three, it occurred 1.5 seconds, or 1,500 milliseconds after the initial event. With a five-second reporting interval, or a 0.5-second reporting interval, we would expect three additional new elements. So you'll see a repeat of the data between events to, uh, from the first event to the second event that's identical. The third event has three new elements at the bottom, and the top ones are consistent with what it was reported before. So everything that's being reported is consistent with what we observed at the scene, with the order and sequence of the events that we observed. Mr. Morris, based on your review of all of the facts and data in this case, did you form an opinion about the cause of this uh, incident? Uh, the, uh, the cause of the incident was the initial impact uh, with the Malibu as the vehicle uh, proceeded westbound on, uh, on uh, St. Charles, failing to yield the right of way at the posted site. Okay. Thank you. No further questions. Yeah. Ross? Uh, 2023, correct? That's correct. Did you go with uh, Officer Moran to remove the modules? I did. So you were there uh, at that point, but you weren't there when he tested it, correct? You were only there when he actually removed the modules. I believe so. All right. So you don't know what care and control he took in evaluating the modules later? No. All right. So let's just say that that module that he was evaluating was not on a flat and level surface. The EDR information would be what? Corrupted? No. It shouldn't have been because if the, if the, the only way it could be corrupted is if it was not a locked event. So it wouldn't have been overwritten. Um, in locked events, 
it, you wouldn't be able to override it, and uh, it would have to be powered up at the time. It, it states in these CDR retrieval things that the uh, information might be con uh, during bench top imaging. Make sure that the ACM is not moved. That's correct. All right. Were you there to witness whether or not it was moved? No. Okay. It says if it's tilted or turned over while connected to and powered by the CDR interface module, it might cause a problem. Right? That's correct. Okay. And again, you're trusting that Moran had done this all correctly, right? Essentially because the data is consistent with the physical evidence recovered at the scene. One of the things that is there, if you can go back to one of these animations, any one of them. Sorry, which one? Any one of them. Can you just turn them off for a second? Yeah. Uh, uh, the one that shows this parked car is moving. Yes. That's a, a bit of a misrepresentation, right? That's a real car, supposed to be there, not a kind of a ghost shadow thing? That's correct. It's an artifact, the way that the, uh, object, the scene was scanned. Okay. It's not an x-ray machine, so it only sees the points that are facing it. So unless a, a, a uh, scan was done on the opposite side of where that vehicle was, it wouldn't capture the other side of the vehicle. All right. And this animation and all these animations are done during the daylight hours, right? That's correct. We didn't try and represent the photometry of the lighting. All right. One of the things that's represented here is based upon the LIDAR information that you use, right? That's correct. Like the position of these cars? Yes. Did you look at the body camera videos? I did not. Do you know if there was a car parked at that yield sign? I'm going to show you what the mark or previously looked at. By Officer Moran. Moran, since the witness can answer the question sure. before he can challenge. So did you want to ask him a question first? Sure. You didn't look at any of the body worn camera? I did not. You didn't verify that diagram before you started your recreation? No. All right. So if you look at this, can you tell me whether or not you might actually see a black car sitting at that corner? There appears to be a car parked there. All right. I'm just referencing your animation here, which is based upon Moran's information. No car there. That's correct. In fact, if there had been a car there, the accident would have occurred here. If you've got that Audi less than eight feet away from that sign. In which direction? When, when it's headed westbound. Okay. It should be moved further to the left. Yeah. The, the vehicle, the standard uh, passenger vehicles are approximately six feet in width. So we it's parked at the curb. There, there still should be sufficient distance for him to pass. Well, should be. But how do we know the car wasn't here? Uh, based upon the location of the physical evidence in, uh, of the scene and the uh, gouge marks and the location of, of where they wound up. So we're looking at the physical evidence recorded at the impact point. But we know the Malibu pushed that Audi to the right. That's correct. We also know that what you measured on the Audi, the apparent front end of the Malibu, the marks on the Audi are shorter than that of the Malibu. Th that's the correct. whole front end of the Malibu is not accounted for in that equation. In the contact point? Yes. Yes. So that would be considered what would be a less than full impact. Less than full impact. Yes. So essentially a full impact is where the colliding surfaces attain a common velocity. So there would be a full momentum exchange. In this particular case, because of the uh, relative speeds of the vehicles at that angle, it's not unexpected. It's not unexpected, but also it could mean that the speed is higher. Because not all the energy was transferred. Some of it was transferred into a, and pushed into a vehicle moving sideways. I'm not sure I understand the question. Sure, it's not a full impact because a lot of the energy from the Malibu was transferred into the Audi. Um, 
essentially what you're looking at there is the relative crush of the two vehicles and the relative stiffness of the two colliding surfaces. So that would have to be something that you would take into account in your equation. And, and you did take into account some stiffness equations, right? That's correct. And one of the things that you did was you got an exemplar from Don Brown. Yes. And what year was that? Um, I believe it was a year after this model year. Is that in your report? Um, I don't know whether it appears in the report or not, but it's within the same model class, so it has the same dimensions and weights. Okay. But you believe that's what it was within a year? That's correct. Okay. And again, what your model here indicates is that the Audi was still on three wheels when it got hit. That's correct. How much energy does it take to put the Audi on one wheel? Uh, it depends on where the force is being applied and the movement of the vehicle. So in this particular case, because it's uh, being applied rearward in the center of mass, you're going to have more rotation than you're going to have lateral movement in translation. So did you, I know you looked up the statistics for a, uh, an Audi and how fast it might go. Did you look up the crash data from NHTSA on a uh, side impact on a Q5 2023? I did not. Would it help if you looked at that? Uh, if they had a, a model to crash in a similar way. Um, so what you're looking at here and most of the side impact crash testing that they do for new car assessment programs are between the two wheels because what they want to test for is occupant protection. In this particular case, the primary impact was at the rear suspension, which would necessarily make it a stiffer uh, coefficient than you, what you would find when it was struck in the side. So in order to model that, more fairly, what I did is, since we have a good um, um, database of data for the Malibu, for frontal collisions, we can then calculate the force uh, that would require to do that deformation, and then use a force balance equation, the technique that was um, outlined in a paper that was authored by Nate Shigemura, which is Nate Shigemura and Andy Rich, that essentially takes the force balance and allows you to calculate the stiffness coefficients based upon known, uh, well-defined stiffness coefficients like the front of the Malibu. So in other words, you didn't look at the NHTSA crash data analysis? No, we didn't. I did not. And still the impact on that, if you would like to look at it, only took one wheel off the ground at 35 miles an hour. Okay. Do, you Do you want to look at it? <clears throat> yes. It's NHTSA. You have you a guys scholarly use... source from NHTSA, not a YouTube video? Well, do you... it is a NHTSA video that's on YouTube. Uh, your, your projection is sustained. Okay. The YouTube video is not a scholarly source. What was the weight of the Malibu in your calculations? Um, I'd have to look at my paperwork, but I, I believe the Malibu was somewhere in the neighborhood of 32, 3,500 pounds. Did you actually weigh the Malibu? We did not. And what was the weight of the uh, Audi? I believe it was 42 to 4,500. Again, and I'd have to, for, to be precise, I would have to look at my paperwork. But did you actually weigh the Audi? We did not. Okay. So, but based upon general statistics, the Malibu weighed less than the Audi. That's correct. And yet the Malibu had still enough force with less weight to lift and start to roll the Audi. That's correct. So essentially, it would need more speed to create more force to take a heavier object off of its wheels. Depending on where you hit it and whether or not there was a mechanical advantage and where you hit it relative to the center of mass, not necessarily. In some of your calculations, you actually show the Malibu coming to rest at about 82 degrees. That's correct. All right. And 
it, it appears from the animation that this was a 90 degree impact, right? Yes, but it rotated as a result of the contact. Where was the EDR um, showing that there was any steering post impact? It wouldn't have been steering post impact that would have resulted in that. Um, the uh, post collision is usually just being governed by the laws of physics. When you have a high delta V collision, usually the driver doesn't maintain control of the vehicle. And in this case, we had some impingement of the front wheels that would have affected the steering post effect. Did you see skid marks from the front wheels of the Malibu that would have indicated that the Audi pushed it? It would have changed direction as a result of the contact, yes. Yeah, and did you find that to exist there uh, at the scene? No. So that wouldn't be consistent with a car that stopped completely but continued to move after it had impacted the Audi. Not sure I understand the question. Sure. The, the Malibu didn't come to rest immediately. That's correct. It continued forward. So for a half a second, at least it continued to move. That's correct. And in that, that's when it went basically from what you're saying, 27 down to zero. Well, a part of that has to do with the delta V of the collision. So the airbag control module data had a, delta, a longitudinal delta V, I believe, somewhere around 11 miles per hour. So it would have gone from 26 to uh, 15, and then would have slowed to rest, likely a result of some impingement of the damage on the front wheels. I, I don't remember seeing 15 on the EDR. It would not have been reported because it's post-collision, not pre-collision. Was there any post-collision information reported? No. So that's just a guess by you. Airbag control module data. I just wanted you to be able to Hold on. You, if you're going to object, you got to yell it out. I just wanted him to be able to finish his answer. Thank you. So finish your answer. Um, essentially, the airbag control module records two elements of data. Pre-crash data, which is five seconds leading up to the crash pulse, or algorithm enabled when the airbag control system wakes up and decides whether or not to deploy the airbag. Then it records a crash pulse post-impact, which includes up to 300 milliseconds of data, which involves the delta V, or the cumulative delta V, and the accelerations of the vehicle. So what re records up to impact is the vehicle recorded speed. So whatever shows up on the speedometer is what it's reporting back to the airbag control module. Post-collision, once the airbag is commanded to deploy or the system wakes up, all you get is the crash pulse data. It's no longer recording vehicle recording. 